So I'm going to open the meeting and call it to order. And um, I will call the roll call. Um, I'm Lynn Kelly. I'm here. Um, Lindsay Rowe, here. Um, Virginia DeSorga, here. Doug Mayo, here. And Bob Williford, here. Okay. Um, we'll need to approve the minutes from March 10th. Did anybody have any corrections to make? Thought it looked pretty. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the minutes. I'll second that. Okay. All right. The minutes are approved. Um, the treasurer's report um, mm -hmm. is posted. We actually have to vote on those. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Always moving things forward here too quickly. Um, so, in favor of the minutes, accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 Okay. It's unanimous. Okay, uh, the treasurer's report is postponed until June of 2022. Since last month, we made a decision to um, report it every uh, three months. Was it three months? Yeah, quarterly. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll start today. I'm sorry, Virginia. Laura you... just joined us, I see. Ah, okay. I see she's muted. Okay. Laura? I wonder if she's having some trouble getting on. I'll be honest, there's been a lot of that going around today <laughs> with some of the meetings we've had to connect with. I don't know if it's yeah. just taxation on the systems or. I, I've also found it seems to be easier to connect if we go through the the link that comes with the calendar as opposed to the one that comes through the email. Oh, all right. Don't know why. <laughs> Just my experience. Yep. Hi, Laura. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, uh, as you can see, we have our guest speaker. Jeff Dugan from the Mass Office on Disability, and um, I'll let him take it away for the moment. <laughs> so my goal today, so first of all, hello, uh, I'm Jeff Dugan from the Massachusetts Office on Disability. I uh, am an assistant director for the Community Services Unit here. Uh, we have, our, our office has three different units, uh, one being the Community Services Unit, I'll go into what that means. Uh, we also have our Disability Rights Unit, which helps people with individualized kind of questions and uh, about re any really topics related to disability. Um, and there were more information and referral, so they could gather some information, they could help. Uh, but that unit, the Disability Rights Unit, also houses the Client Assistance Program, which is a federal uh, required thing. Every state has to have one. We, it's housed in MOD uh, with us, uh, and you know, New Hampshire will be with somebody else and stuff like that. But we, uh, the Client Assistance Program helps people who have gone or tried to get services from the uh, voc rehab agencies like MRC, MCB, um, and, and other agencies, or from even local ILs. And if they don't feel they're getting the correct services, we are the in-betweens to try to resolve that, get that resolved, and get those things worked out. Um, we also will help people sometimes with through employment options uh, if they have been discriminated against. Uh, we may help them through the MCAD complaint process. Uh, all the way to probable cause. So that unit is very active and very helpful. It's very useful for individualized kind of questions. Uh, they are also getting more and more involved with state agencies to ensure that uh, they're aware of their obligations on their hiring and, and other things there. So there's been a little bit of shift rather than them focusing solely on consumers uh, or individuals. They are now shifting obviously consumers still, but also working with other state agencies. Uh, as a quasi separate unit, uh, we do now have somebody who's helping state agencies understand their IT AT obligations, information technology and accessibility assistive technology. So state agency rolls out programs, you know, every day, <laughs> every program, you know, programs and and, uh, and and materials, and sometimes they're not accessible. So 
that's where we're hoping the task force that we're set, setting up and leading is going to help ensure that there are no more of this, no more breaks in the communication, no more breaks in the program. So employees for the Commonwealth can use the system just as well as somebody outside coming in to use the system. So uh, we have a, our, our Rob Diaz who's been here about 10 years is, is leading that charge along with Mary, our executive director. Um, we also have, um, well, so we have my unit, community services. We do a lot of trainings, working with commissions on disabilities, uh, and uh, and pretty much uh, we manage the emergency preparedness grant, as well as the uh, municipal ADA improvement grant program. That's housed in my unit as well. So, uh, unfortunately, I have three people at, at, at this time. I have myself, uh, who's doing a lot of the, the stuff. Uh, we have Ashley Santana, who is now our new access specialist, so she's getting up to speed. So if you have questions related to building architectural access, uh, she can be a resource for you. Uh, she started here. Uh, and um, we have Evan George, who runs and manages the emergency preparedness program. Right now, I've, we used to have a grant compliance officer for the ADA grant program, but for now, I'm running that. Uh, we are looking to fill that position, but that's coming down. So. Um, so I do a lot of outreach, working with commissions, working with the community, working with uh, ensuring building accessibility, as well as communication access, as well as municipalities understanding their Title II obligations. So um, there's a lot of stuff that, that my unit does. And I'll first start with, I want to share with you a document that um, I'm just putting together, not putting together now, but I want to show you that what we're going to go through today. So let me um, see if I can show this here. So what I'm hoping is you're able to see, and it might be small, but it's um, it's a list of documents that we're going to talk about. Not all of them today. I'm zooming in. <laughs> to see what I'm sending you. Uh, some of the the, the <clears throat> colored ones uh, are there because that's what I actually have up on opening Chrome that I'm going to go over today. But if you look, you can see that we have our client assistance pro program brochure here. So if you're curious about what that is, you can look here. We have our community services brochure, my brochure of what I do, so you can see some more about that. Um, you guys don't need to worry about establishing a commission uh, or even the best practice of performing uh, that because you got you have been this Greenfield Commission has been around for a, a long time. So um, I'm not really going to dive into that, but it is good to talk about maybe with new memberships. Um, for example, let me just quickly open up the um, the benefits of establishing, and again, I'll get. To, um, I will do that when I get a second right now. I'm going to on this one, but we're going to talk about the general laws. There's resources to the ADA homepage, service animal stuff, uh, action guide. We're going to go over checklist. We'll go over the architectural access board as we know that, you know, commissions are tied to the architectural access board because if there's a variance or a complaint filed in, um, in Greenfield, uh, the commission is one of the people's that are, one of the groups that are notified. The building inspector would also be notified, and as well as the local independent living center would be notified. So you, you're tied to the access board. That's why I always try to keep our up, our listing up to date uh, for people. Um, we'll talk about some of the IT stuff because that's definitely stuff the state has improved since I think we've last spoken. And I want to make sure you guys are aware of certain availabilities now that are available to municipal, municipal government. Um, we all know about project civic access from the enforcement by DOJ. I did want to give that here so you could at least see, okay, here's the mass settlements. There haven't been any recent mass settlements as of late, uh, but it is something to look. This is when DOJ pretty much comes out and says, hey, Greenfield, uh, we want to see all your five administrative requirements. And they're gonna, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but uh, that's when they come knocking on the door to see um, if you have those. And that's usually where the settlements start to enter if towns haven't met their obligations. We also have some very new fact sheets uh, that came out during COVID, but we have outdoor dining. That's something that is a big thing that's happening throughout the state. Uh, so we have some outdoor dining uh, fact sheets and, and what that looks like for accessibility. And in fact, maybe we'll close with that so I can show you that. Uh, we have the parking fact sheet that's been around forever. Uh, we do have a COVID-19 memo that we sent out at the beginning to really make sure that people understand that you know, accessibility, especially technology that we're using to connect people and remote access and things like that. Uh, of the reminding of the, the obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, as well as guidance for accessible vir virtual training. So all of this stuff, you're going to be emailed probably tomorrow, not, not later today, but tomorrow. So you don't have to write any of this stuff down. You're all going to get it, uh, especially the recording secretary. You don't need to panic. 
because this will all come to you. And this is really becomes a kind of a guidebook for commissions. If uh, if commissions want to be refocused, if commissions want to have new members, and maybe even as a new chair comes in, they can review this document. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. And Lynn, please give me um, a time frame that you would like me to speak. When would you like me to stop talking so I can take questions? And I don't remember if we agreed on like a 30 minute or a 45 minute or did we agree? Because <laughs> you have other business to get through, so I don't want to take your entire meeting. Oh, and you might be muted. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, why don't we say, um, uh, are you talking about, uh, 45 minutes and then questions? Let's do 30 minutes, then questions. And then questions. Okay. okay. I wasn't sure whether that time frame included questions or not. Okay. I think yeah, that would be good. 30 plus questions if there are, um, and we can ask questions in between. So I'm going to set my timer for 30 minutes and that'll remind me and then we'll start narrowing it down. So let me stop sharing. This other screen. Uh, share content. Let me just share what I have open now. All right. So let me get back to here. Let me definitely zoom in. All right. Some of these things I'm going to go through pretty quick because I just, you know, there's times where you, um, the stuff that you've already seen before or can easily get to. But this is our uh, new uh, MOD brochure. That we have here it talks about the client assistance program talks about our additional resources that we have here but we also down here have quick links to some of our trainings like the community access monitor training which we have started up the ada improvement grant program which i know greenfield has applied to a bunch of times and i think only been awarded once um, i would urge that greenfield reapply in the fy 23 cycle um, because which will be opening up in august this year um, Commission links to the commission page, personal emergency preparedness, the client assistance program that we talked about, which even up here, so you can get more detail. And the New England ADA Center, we are, they are one of 10 regionalized ADA information centers uh, that are throughout the country. Uh, and we are the Massachusetts affiliate to the New England ADA Center out of Boston. They have a lot of this stuff. And a few of the documents I'm gonna go over are directly from them. So that I think will help you. Uh, and we just redesigned a little bit. This was me out in Pittsfield measuring a curve cut, a cross level of a curve cut in the picture uh, a bunch of years ago. Uh, hopefully I've lost some weight by the, before then, uh, after then. Um, and it just goes through what, what our agency does. So I'm going to be pretty quick on that because we touched upon a little bit. Uh, I also just want to make a mention that MOD also serves on the architectural access board, the state building, the board that promulgates and enforces the architectural uh, the, the architectural access for people with disabilities. So, uh, so I actually sit on there every other week and we, it's a, it's a, a board that, uh, we have hearings, we have cases, we review, uh, and this is where, if we got feedback from the Greenfield commission on disabilities about a project happening, uh, we looked very heavily on comments from the commission on disabilities. So I don't want to, you know, if you get some sort of notice. At least send an email to the executive director, William Joyce, saying you either support or don't support. And, you know, at least to let us know to get us a sense, because we rely heavily on commissions on disabilities as well as building inspectors to be the eyes on the ground out in that area. So, you know, your, your community much better. Uh, with that, let me go to. Um, so that there's, this is about uh, about MOD, but let me also show you, you guys are a mass general law chapter 40 section H a commission. That has been adopted in, in your city, uh, and this is just the general law that covers it. We are going to, a little bit later on, talk about what these six goals are here, which, again, you've probably already worked out and, and done there, but the, the law spells out what commissions should be doing. And as you're aware, commissions on disabilities are their advisory. Is, they act as in their advisory role to their appointing authority. So for you, it's probably the city council or the mayor, right? Or... I'm trying to make sure I got the right form of government uh, for you, but uh, you know that's who you are advising uh, through through your role, uh, as well as trying to, to to. And these six goals are what the advising would ultimately, in a perfect world, a commission would be able to take on. Now you're you are all volunteers, most of you, uh, so you're serving, doing a good civic duty, really, and it's really needed. But you're but you're volunteers. So you only have the expertise you have 
that people bring to the table. So if you don't have someone who's very knowledgeable in housing, let's say, housing may not be your strong point. And you may need to figure out an avenue of who we might refer that out to, should we need to, or who can we contact to get the answer and then get the answer back to the consumer or agency that might be reaching out to us. So we're gonna talk about the various goals in, in a few minutes, but this lays out the goals, the general law. It's good for new members to see this. It also lays out the membership, you know, five to 13, what the membership looks like. A majority of people should be uh, people with disabilities. One can be an immediate family member of a person with a disability and one should be an elected or appointed official of that city or town. So, you know, that's a specific makeup for a commission. And that's where most commissions struggle to find the membership to meet this criteria. Uh, we have some workarounds, but I'm, I'm just going to say again, you're, you're, you guys are up and running and have the membership already running. Uh, it also lays out the terms for the initial again, that's way beyond. Um, but it also talks about how you might deal with a vacancy or if you need to remove someone for just cause. Um, also, something often overlooked and I want to, I only really am going to recall this out because. On the commission I was on in the last 2 years, we've been left a small amount of money as a gift. Uh, that we've received as a commission on disability. So, uh, you, just to clarify, you are as a commission able to receive gifts of property, both real and personal. For example, we received a couple of $500 donations to the commission as a gift, but that was earmarked for us to give it back to the uh, special education department in our schools uh, for a very specific purpose, but it was through us to them. So, um, so you are able to do that as well. Um, so that's the, the main law that you've adopted. I do not believe Greenfield has enacted uh, Section 22G of Chapter 40, which would allow the some or all of the parking fines to come back to a separate revolving account to the commission to then use. You don't um, collect parking fines, right? We don't collect them, but we do have an account, a handicapped parking account. That is set up through the city specifically from oh. the fines. Oh, okay. And is that something you ultimately control or can make recommendations of the spending? Yes. Yeah. So, so you must have adopted 22G then. Yes. Okay. For some reason I had you as you, as you didn't, but I'm very happy we connected because that's another one. Uh, you know, and, and we're getting, we're finding more and more now that we're, uh, it used to be that was an outlier that people would collect the fines, but we're finding now that about at least 50% of the commissions now are collecting the fines because there's really good things you can do with it. Mm -hmm. Very creative. I mean, we just purchased in situ, we just purchased a grit freedom wheelchair, uh, that we're going to donate to the library that, um, that people can use when they're going out on trails and going out in, uh, uneven spots. It's, it's meant for upper body strength, obviously, but it's a modified wheelchair that allows someone to use some posts to to help them get over rough terrain. Oh, right. Yeah. But it's an upper body machine. So if you don't have the upper body strength, it's a little bit difficult, but it's a wheelchair. And it's just one of the many tools we're offering uh, to them. And we, and we purchased it for them. And, you know, a lot of commissions have done some very unique things with that. Um, mm. I'm sure you guys have as well um, when you've offered it up. So I just like to include this one as well, because if you haven't enacted it, it's something you can, or for communities that have, it's a good reminder of what that law is how it's to be used, uh, and it's used solely for the benefit of people with disabilities. So, it, and it's because of the nature of the monies, uh, it has to be used for public use. So it has to be for a municipal project, a municipal initiative, or something donated to the municipal entity. <laughs> entity. Uh, it, you know, you might be able to do some, like for example, if you were to purchase handicapped parking signs for every single business in Greenfield, then you could use your handicap parking fines because you wouldn't necessarily be in violation of the antitrust laws uh, because you might be doing something called for the greater good of the community, you know, for the better for the betterment of the community. So hmm. some uses there, but again, most commissions just deal with municipal stuff because there's enough there to spend the money on. So uh, they don't need to go anywhere else with the money. Uh, so this just shows you how it's done. It's a revolving account. Basically, the commission gets to decide what it's used for. And as long as it's a legal purpose, it's per, uh, legal purpose, uh, then the mayor and city council, or however the process is, would sign off on it, and then it would happen. The reason I talk about that is because that lays the groundwork for the commission. And then I was just sharing, and I'm going to go through this quick because I I think we've seen this, but it's a useful tool. Um, this document here um, will go through. I'm sorry, I thought I had something else. 
Um, it's it. Let me come back. The first page, and this has been around, I believe, since I've since when I started, and I've been with MOD about 20, 22 years at this point. Um, and I've updated it to keep up the life, but I haven't updated the director. So David Dr. Angelo is not a director. Uh, Mary Mahan McCauley from MR, who used to work at MRC, uh, is now our executive director. But um, what I wanted to share with you is this just is just a description of what the commissions do. So it lists a lot of the rules here. It also lists the membership, just to kind of give you an, uh, uh, what the laws are talking about in, in a nutshell. And then the other related laws. So HA obviously is, is linked there. 504 of the Rehab Act requires inter inclusion and integration of people with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires very much the same thing as the Rehab Act. So this is how and why commissions were developed and, and started to be uh, some of that uh, assistance to the communities. Article 114 is, is really the Constitution Amendment that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. Uh, and the regulations of the Architectural Access Board, uh, which requires access in a built uh, or newly renovated environment. So those are laws that apply or that work with or are in tandem with the Commission on Disabilities. And we have sample operating bylaws. I'm going to go through this quick because you probably already have your own. Or, or you already know your operation of business, but it goes through here. If you were going to try to refocus uh, or wanted to refocus. You could adopt or update your, your bylaws, but it talks about title and purpose, the powers and duties of a commission, which again, these, I don't, I don't know if, um, this doesn't let me annotate, right? Like, I don't think I can annotate, or can I? Annotate, I can, yay. Okay, um, so these items here, and there's actually 10, because it's, I think it's one more page down, uh, but these items here um, are going to, uh, will be described as the goals at the end of this document. So this is basically what a commission does. It's researches problems, it coordinates activities, it reviews and makes recommendations about policies, works with the local uh, ADA coordinator, uh, working with departments, uh, ensuring public awareness, all stuff you currently do as a commission. It's just memorializes it and, and really, um, let me just see if I can, okay. Uh, and then the, actually it goes on, down here uh, to receive gifts uh, and take actions as commission seems appropriate for equal status of persons with disabilities. So there, these are the 10 and 11 really goals that a commission has to do or, or should be charged to do. Uh, and then it, then it, so that's that. Then it comes into the membership makeup. Again, I'm not gonna go into that, but if you're curious what the, the chairperson has to do, there is a listing of that. But um, this does talk about how people can resign, uh, how members might be, uh, Filled if there's a vacancy, uh, how people might be so removed if for, for just cause if they need to. Um, so it's just a good thing to have in your in your arsenal. Then this is the officer section, which talks about a chairperson, vice chair, or co-chair, uh, secretary, and treasurer. And this is kind of their duties that they that they do. Um, so it's good for someone as they join for new membership. Um, if they want to take on the secretary role, this is what they'd be doing. They want to try to run for chair or be voted in as chair. This is what they do. So, um, so it sets out the groundwork there. And then it talks the meetings, how to make up the meetings. This, this, uh, the six year limit here, or six year, uh, six meetings a year. That's an old uh, holdover from previous. Um, most commissions are meeting ten times a year, um, just because there's so much to do, and especially for for a town the size of Greenfield, it might be tough not to do less, to do less than ten as a commission. So. Um, so the six is really for smaller communities if they can even swing that now. Uh, quorum is a quorum of the membership, not just four. It's going to be for you guys if you have six members. You know that'll be uh, you need fifty one percent. So you would it would be four for six members for you guys uh, if you depending on your membership. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about this because this is stuff you already do, but you know decisions are done by the majority, and I assume you guys are following the Roberts Rules of Order. Is that how you run your meetings? I assume. Okay. Uh, so that's typically how commissions run it. I've some commissions actually run by town meeting rules, and I'm not sure how that plays out. But um, Robert's rule is a general one. And then how do you make amendments? It just it it sets it out in a policy that by a two thirds vote, membership can make amendments to this. Uh, let me scroll down because this is really where I wanted to get to, and let me just annotate if I can a little bit. Um, so we have ten goals that we talked about, and there's ten goals listed here. 
the first part is just basically what is the what does the MGL kind of lead you to, and what what are the goals under the MGL, which is this. One is to ensure municipal services, programs, meetings, and employment opportunities are available to and accessible to people with disabilities. So how is that accomplished? Well, there's some ways that the commission can can do. You know, this is what we're um, uh, how you might accomplish that process. And then this is how you might implement it or get to working on meeting this obligation. And then here's some examples down below. And again, if you want me, to, I can scooch in a little bit further. Let me just stop annotating. Um, sorry, uh, I just want to zoom in a little bit. See it a little better. Um, yeah. So there's the there's this part here. So for this, they recommend you know meeting with appropriate departments. Uh, I can't stress that enough. If you haven't, I would assume you are meeting with staff people pretty regularly. I would say if you. Every six months, you should at least be meeting with the uh, select board or oh, not select board. I'm sorry, the city council, just to make sure that uh, everyone remembers who's there and who that you know who the chair is and who they can contact. So a lot of commissions drop this. I am assuming Greenfield does this, or they are aware of you because of your longstanding. Uh, you've been even a longstanding commission in, in in Greenfield. So for new commissions, I'm often saying, hey, you got to make the time to meet with your select board or the mayor. Meet time with the planning board. Meet. Make yourself known to the inspectional services department and in other departments that you're going to have some some links in, because if you have allies in those departments, that's who you're going to go to to try to get stuff resolved. Uh, and and or send people to them uh, should you need to. Um, that's just 1 of the many different things to meet this goal that we've listed here to kind of take on and then examples of how that might happen. Uh, for example, all public meetings should be held in accessible locations. Uh, and then, you know, sign language interpreters should be available where you aren't asking for accommodations up front. You know, so for example, when we have town meeting in our town, uh, we work very hard to, to identify that if they're going to have, they need to have a process in order for somebody to make a request. So, you know, that has, was something that our town wasn't doing for a long time, but we've just, um, sorry, let me just make sure. Um, but we've, but now our town has made sure that when they put the warrant out for for showing people that there is somebody that they can connect with to contact should they need some sort of accommodation to attend. Uh, again, I'm, I won't go through all of these. Uh, then, just like for state and local government, that first goal, we're going to look at the second goal, which is the businesses and nonprofits and things like that. Uh, they have different responsibilities, but uh, but there's different ways of approaching them. And how we might work with them. So one of them is introducing them to that tax incentive that's been around forever. That is a nice icebreaker with them that they can get some money uh, or or basically a tax deduction for bar physical barrier removal. And there's also like a five thousand dollar tax credit for um, I believe communication access in case they need to, to do things for a small business. But it's also in your job if you are taking that on in your role. Some commissions don't work with. Anything but title two entities, just because there's so much to do with that alone. You may not have time to deal with private business responsibilities as well. Uh, encouraging mobility is another goal and we give examples increasing affordable housing. The reason I'm calling these out is that you may not have someone with expertise. In the housing department, that's where you just need to have your. Um, the resources, you know, is there a housing authority in, in Greenfield? I would assume there is. That's one resource you might link them to. You might link them to MOD. You might link them because it might be better to link them to the independent living center in your area who can help them find housing if they're looking for that. Uh, and I'm trying to remember Greenfield. Is that Adlib? Is Adlib? No, it's one? it's Stavros. So, oh, you said that before. I'm so sorry. So Stavros. Yeah. yeah so Stavros, uh, just like BCIL and Metro West uh, Center for Independent Living, they do have. Uh, they're probably the best resource. For people to work with to try to find accessible, affordable housing, because the IL centers work uh, and man maintain a listing um, of available housing through. You know, this is a requirement through I think federal housing through, through FHA through Mass laws and different things that there's this registry of accessible housing that's available. So as new things are opened up and available, they're supposed to go on this registry. So if you, Lynn, want to look for a two bedroom that is fully accessible. Um, you at least have some hitbacks of types of available units that might be available in your area. So, uh, but you may not have the expertise at the table. 
So this might be where at least knowing some of the resources or reaching out to MOD and then we could tell you to say, hey, you, know, you really should probably get them to Starbros or get them to this group to help. So we can, we can either take the deferral or we can give you the answer so you can provide the answer back. Uh, it's however you want. MOD is pretty flexible with that. Uh, but there are 10 goals here. Uh, and they're pretty, you know, relatively easy goals. But um, again, depending on your expertise, you may need to reach out uh, or refer them out to, to different groups. So let me stop here just for about 10 seconds. Does anybody have questions about this? Or um, I want to dive into, because we're down to about 10 minutes, I want to dive into some of the new documents that I want to share with you rather than some of the old, older stuff. But let me let me just quickly go through another resource on disability rights laws. It's just a really good resource to have. It has a lot, of, and it's it's in oh, yeah, and you probably can't even see this. Um, it has all the various disability and state laws here. Everything from housing to wheelchair lemon law. Uh, if somebody asks you about a certain question, you know, and you have a question about let's say service animals, well, let's go to. Can I did I actually do it? Oh, things are open. Okay. It will jump you to public, you know, uh, sorry, service animals, to the service animal section. And it gives you a nice little blurb and then a general law that links you to it with who enforces it. Uh, so there's, it's a really great resource there. Um, I'm sorry, let me try to get to my stuff and I can't because it's behind this thing. All right. I'm sorry. Just give me two seconds. We go. Um, disability rights law booklet. This is one I definitely want to spend a little bit of time on. There's um, before before you go, I just want to ask about the booklet. Is it is it possible to get a hard copy of that? Um, um, do they have any more of them? <laughs> oh, yeah. So we yeah we did stop printing them uh, because everything's up on our website and the publications. If you do want it. Um, if you want any of these things that aren't like 10,000 pages long, I'd be more than happy to print them in Lynn and send them to you. Like, I'm not going to be able to print out. Um, sorry. Just wish this thing would move. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's, there's a bar up there. Let me see if I can. can I, uh, okay. I'm not going to be able to print out this thing. I'm not going to be able to print out this. But any yeah. of these other things I think I can print out and send you if, if you would like. Um, um, I just remember that. There used to be one of those, uh, th that one, yep. that brochure that you just showed us with all the laws listed. Yep. Um, Do you want but, me to put it out a bunch and send them to you? I mean, they're not in books anymore, those small little books. They're going to be eight and a half by 11, just paper stapled together. Yeah, that's fine. That is, that's perfectly fine. Okay. okay. Uh, and then when they get updated, hopefully we'll be notifying and announcing it to commission. So then. Uh, mm -hmm. we can work on that as well. So yes, I will. I will get you about ten copies of this document. Oh, great! Okay, that would be great. It might be a good idea to, uh, and you, you alluded to it before, is uh, is getting the links to some of the things that you've uh, you've been talking about. Uh, and I think what you said in the beginning is that you were going to you were going to provide that. Uh, um, at the end of the within uh, within a couple of uh, days or so, that you would you would be able to send out links to some of the things that you've talked about. Uh, I I think that would be uh, very advantageous for us. Uh, oh yeah, oh definitely. I'm that's yeah. I I'm gonna print out this booklet because I know Lynn likes like people like paper copies of this too. So I want to print this out and send this one too. But everything we're talking about today plus extra. I'm going to be sharing with you after the event via an email to Lynn, who will then share it with the rest of the commission. So you'll all have the links on hand. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that definitely. Definitely. So let me talk about two things that I just really want to share. And I'm glad that the ADA coordinator is here as well. If, 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 uh, if they have not been uh, aware of this, the New England ADA Center has put this out. It's a really great tool to understand what the five administrative requirements under the ADA under ADA Title II, what's required for state, local, and county governments. So if you are curious about, first of all, the general overviews, there is introduction. This talks about some of the overarching responsibilities of the ADA and how it links to Title II, state and local government. 
So if you're curious about the general non-discrimination overviews, you can click this part and it brings you right in to that section with examples and you can just keep going down. Effective communication, what that means under the ADA, what web accessibility looks like, and I know I'm going through pretty quick, but you'll have this. Also, what emergency preparedness is looking like under the federal ADA responsibilities, which is very helpful for an ADA coordinator to understand that a lot of this stuff is going to be tied back to the departments and part of the self-evaluation and transition plan that's being developed. Uh, and then the biggest section that they come on to is the administrative requirements. And there's five administrative requirements, as we learned uh, if you've attended our community access monitor training. Uh, the, the five administrative requirements, let me just get back to this part, are all here. Step two through six, this is what DOJ requires of municipal, municipal governments that have over 50 employees. The appointment of the ADA coordinator, and should someone want to know what that means, guess what? There's a nice little summary here of what the roles and duties and how what um, uh, what uh, municipal ADA coordinators do, along with, uh, again, I think these will link you through it, um, notice, providing public notice, what that looks like, where you might need to post it, and they even give you samples of the language to use. So it's a really great tool to use and have on hand. Uh, how to conduct a self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, and they even give sample forms. And the development of a transition plan, what that might look like and what obligations are there, as well as the resulting action plan, uh, which is a, an additional step that would take. And it just keeps uh, that transition plan and self-evaluation as a living document moving forward. So they, and they give some examples here of how that plays out. It's a very useful tool to have. Uh, on hand. Um, resulting from that, they also developed, the New England ADA Center also developed the ADA checklist for existing facilities. So now if you if you were asked as Greenfield, hey, Green, hey Commission, uh, can you tell me if the town hall, if the bathroom at the town hall is compliant with the ADA? Well, guess <laughs> what? You can now use this wonderful checklist that can help you with it. Uh, exa for example, toilet rooms. Let me just open up the PDF. There's different versions for it. But what this does, it asks you yes or no questions on all of the regulations under the 2010 ADA design standards. And if something is deficient, you're identifying it. You can identify can I, that. Oh. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, sure thing. Because I do use this, um, okay. which is an incredible tool. Do you know, because my understanding is it does not catch Massachusetts AAB. Do you know if anyone's updated this to do AAB? Because that always seems a little iffy when I go to use it. So, no. <laughs> uh, this particular document is purely a federal, from the federal ADA perspective, because, you know, for Title II stuff, and even for Title III, there might need to be changes made when even you weren't fun, when you were not planning on making changes. So, this is definitely the, the federal perspective. There is a document out there that at least captures the differences between the 2006 AAB codes and the 2010 ADA design standards. So there is a different document, not a yes or no thing, but you could use this and then go back to that other document. It's something you have to pay, you have to buy, but it's from an architect firm. It's at a glance and it looks at both, and I can tell, I'll share a link of it. It's very unique. It's, it, I think it still comes on a CD. So. Good luck trying to get installed, but uh, it's it's you know it's it's a CD. I think they send you, uh, and it it has all of those cross comparisons. So when you find okay, hey, let me find one. The signs not located. Well, that's a bad example because we have diametrically opposed locations for sign mountings of signs. Uh, let me find like a fixture, um, like the maneuvering clearance here. You know, if you found that this was deficient under the 2010 ADA design standards, then you could use that other resource because you'd have okay 404.2. What's the AB comparable? You can go back to that document now, and that that uh, that third party document really uh, to use. But it does. But I'll send you that. All right, I'll send you the link to it. That would be great because I know I've been talking to our facilities management team, um, especially over at the schools, which is brand new, and um, it's really confusing to them for me to hand them this and then say, "But wait, there's more," and some of them are completely opposed to each other, and. This trumps that, except it's just, it's really difficult to kind of explain that in a concise way. It definitely is. Well, here's what you, here's what you can say. Anything that has a no to this is a potential civil rights, civil rights mm -hmm. deficiency. 
when we look at the building code, while yes, it's still very important and the same, it's not that same level, it's a building code issue, which means their architect and designer should really be able to take your civil rights analysis here and take that back and know what the what the state is, but oftentimes they don't and you, and you have to be that resource to them. So yes, I will get you that link because uh, it's, it's something that we're looking at as well. The Architectural Access Board is actually in the process of trying to update their regulations, although that's been, it's, it's, it's been a while for that. So we're still trying to do that. So we're hoping at one, at some point that it will be a one book state. The objective this time is to take IBC, uh, ANSI, Fair Housing, 2010 ADA, Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, and basically make a one book state. So if you come in here, you're safe harbor. So you wouldn't have to say, here's the ADA stuff, but don't forget, there's all this whole other thing that's the AAB. Where you're going to be able to say, here it is, and it's just one answer. But you might not have a checklist, though, because it'll be different. But we'll see. Uh, it's just a great tool to have on hand to give you at least the ADA perspective. Um, let me, uh, sorry, that thing really does get in the way. Uh, let's see. I do want to share just one other thing because I think it's going to be good for uh, for you as the ADA coordinator as the commission as well. And I've just met my 30 minute mark. So let me just quickly get through two more and then we'll be done. What I wanted to share with you is that the state does have uh, technology accessibility obligations for state agencies, which can also filter down to municipalities. But the biggest thing I wanted to share with you is the new service contract that's out there. If you need to um, there's a statewide IT accessibility services that state agencies can use, but it's also available to local municipalities. So if someone asks you for something in Braille, there is a vendor that's been pre-vended or pre, uh, pre-looked pre at to figure out uh, who could do that. Like, so it might be the Perkins School for the Blind, might do National Braille Press, but there's vendors now that state has that the state can use this contract on without having to put it out to bid and all of that good stuff. So it's really a very useful tool or otherwise, you know, towns are scratching their head. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it was. Uh, there's audit services, there's consulting services, document rec remediation, so if you have older documents that need to be accessibilified, if that's really a word. Um, but, you know, <laughs> PDFs have very strict obligations when you post them of what they need to look like and how all, you know, the, the background of it for, for screen readers would work. Uh, as, well, as, as well as training services and multimedia stuff, uh, there's all kinds of stuff here, but, um, it is really a, a, a very good tool that came out a couple of years ago. So I just try to advertise it as much. Again, you'll be shared this uh, in the email that I send you along with uh, some further information about, you know, website accessibility stuff as well. So you'll, you'll get that here, but it's a really, it's a great uh, contract to use, especially for some of those items that Greenfield might not be able to do in house. Um, very last thing is our grant program. I know that Greenfield is aware of it. Greenfield will be notified about the FY23, um, but this is our page. You'll get this information uh, for um, when we open it up, uh, probably in July, we'll make the announcement of the dates. Uh, so be on the lookout in July. So uh, um, we yes. did receive uh, some a grant from, from you folks uh, to do our transition plan. Um, so we're, we're hoping enough time has elapsed that we can come back and ask for some of the things to implement it. Yeah. And you have come back and asked and I, I, I and don't we think, did not, and we did not get it. Yeah, I, I know. I think you've done 3 project grant. Applications, I, I, I look quickly as I came on. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the past history and I think Greenfield has applied. Uh, three times for a project grant and it got, it's been denied three times. We funded a planning grant. I would strongly, strongly, strongly urge, uh, a reapplication of a, you know, of a reasonable request, you know, of a reasonable amount request, mm -hmm. um, in this FY 23 cycle. Um, I want to just for 1 strategy session, just to kind of give you uh, what I see the selection committee kind of how they are selecting. Um, you know, we say that up to $250,000, but as I kind of, and I jokingly say it, but it's kind of like the Willy Wonka ticket. You know, there aren't too many of those given out just because if we all we did was give out 250,000, we'd have like eight grants for the year. So, um, so we're looking to obviously smaller grants as well. We, we want to hit about 30. We want to offer about 30 grants. 
And some of them are going to be planning to update or create a self evaluation and transition plan. And we also want to make sure there's a, a good mix of project grants as well. So just put a cover letter, whoever's going to apply, if it's going to be the, if it's going to be you as the ADA coordinator, put a cover letter, just reminding the commission or reminding the selection committee that, Hey, you know, we've applied in the past three times. We've been denied. We do have a planning grant and this project ties right back to the, to the self evaluation and transition plan that you help fund. <laughs> and and we'll look at the rule of some barriers. So just do that. And I will also put a little stickler on um, in what some of the information we share with the, well, we share everything, but with the selection committee to make sure that Greenfield is is called out specifically. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't like to see three, three times in a row being denied. Um, and the last one wasn't that much. I think you were asking for maybe 60 or 70,000 right. roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we are definitely focusing on uh, historically marginalized communities or gateway communities. And I believe Greenfield is one of those communities. So just, you know, spruce up the cover letter to draw our attention to those facts. Cause that is a new category of what we look at, uh, as we analyze the application. So, uh, so I wanted to share that with you and this will open up in August uh, and it'll probably be till the end of September to apply, which means turnaround times are going to be a lot quicker because we're automating a lot of things. The contracts will be done through Adobe sign this year. So it'll just be. To speed it up and give you more time to do the work. Just want to show some of the other things you're going to get. This is the benefits of creating. Again, you don't really need this as a commission, but it's good for new members to kind of have a nice colorful brochure to say, hey, this is what we do. Uh, as well as there's outdoor dining stuff that we talked about uh, in obligations there. And this is a disability laws book. So let me stop sharing and come back. Or, um, yeah, let me stop sharing and come back. How do I start? Oh, the big orange button says so stop sharing. Okay. Good. Now we can see everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So I know I threw a lot of stuff at you and a lot of quick, quick overview. I am hoping I was meeting some of the intent, Lynn, of why you wanted me out, but I'd like to take any sort of questions people might have. It doesn't have to be about the materials, but it can be um, that people might have. Um, so I'm, I am at your beck and call. So what would you do? <laughs> um. I, I okay, Doug. Why don't you go? You have your hand up. I have a question, Jeff. What do you do if you're finding that uh, uh, the city is basically dragging your feet on some of the on some issues that we the 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 commission has continually brought up to them, and they appear to be dragging their feet, uh, and uh, th this is. Not a complaint against Laura. Laura has been great. Uh, this, but she's not the person with the uh, the uh, the money purse that is uh, uh, allowing th simple things uh, like uh, sidewalk fixes and uh, 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 curb cuts and things of that nature that don't cost a lot of money. Uh, Matter of fact, our DPW does a lot of the work in house, um, and uh, all they need is a little bit of funding to get the material, and they do the work themselves. Um, but we have run across uh, a mayor who seems to be uh, uh, not prioritizing some of the things that the commission has asked for, and we want to get an idea of what kind of power do we have to kind of move things along if we run across that kind of uh, um, problem. So this is where it gets into the, as a commission on disabilities, you are an advisory board to your appointing authority. So you have raised this issue up to the appropriate departments, to the appropriate people, it is now, it's basically you're th throwing up the smoke signal, right? Basically saying that this is a red flag here. We have some concerns about it. Uh, and this is why, but ultimately at, the, and I, ultimately at the end of the day, it's up to the town to gap that liability, that, the, that, that liability exposure, not the commission. The commission, well, here's the, the other avenue could be if it's like a curb cut and the town's just not moving on getting something fixed. It could be something you use the HP parking fines to just do on your, you know, to, to do on your own, and you you line item it from your account to the DPW, and they do it. Um, so it might, you know, 
I'm not saying that's going to solve every problem and it shouldn't be the commission's responsibility to fix everything. But for the things that you find might be dragging, it's like, hey, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it. And, right. you know, and make the good press from you. Obviously, but uh, and I'm not saying this in a bad way. I'm not saying be confidential. It's, you know, there is you're on a board, you're on a public board. So everything has to be done appropriately and, and cordially. Um, but if you find that there's something that you think you could afford and want to do, it's something you could do and advertise and say, look, it's not a whole lot of money. We spent you know four thousand dollars to fix this curb cut because that's about what they go for. In house might be a little bit cheaper, but you know they're about four to five thousand dollars per curb cut nowadays. Um, so you know it could be that the commission felt that this was important. What does the transition plan say about right. something? You know, finding where it lives on that document. Is, well, is the city also have you have you guys recommended that the city pull out a line item every year to say? We're going to have X amount of dollars allocated from our annual budget every year to fix items on this transition plan. Have they have they gotten to that point yet? And they might not. No. Uh, Virginia has her hand up. Oh, uh, you can answer. Uh, I, yeah, I think we have to be a little bit more assertive with that because the things on our transition plan have not been done appropriately. Sidewalks. We've had a lot of we have people injured on sidewalks. Um, they're um, sidewalks that were listed in the transition plan as as needed to be being done. And um, every year we don't have a say on that, but funding is cut from the sidewalk budget. So perhaps a statement, um, perhaps a statement and something where we say what needs to be done. I was sure that this year um, money would be in the capital budget to do, because last year, I didn't vote for this because it, um, last year uh, bocce courts were um, voted in as a capital project, but they were, we didn't vote in the money for an accessible path. So I, I didn't vote for it or accessible water fountains. I thought we can't build a new, in my opinion, just opinion, but I think, I think it's the law that you shouldn't be making a new, um, something that everyone can't participate in. And the other half of that did not go into that. So maybe a statement from us, because there were things in that that were supposed to be done in a timely fashion. And maybe that should be part of, I mean, we could even be looking at that today. Cause right now we're, right now we're in the midst of that and it, and it isn't going, and you have to work nicely. Um, but that hasn't been Happened. effective. But, and I, you know, in the commission, again, just you're serving, you know, you, you have a term to serve, you're appointed to it, you're volunteers, but in a way you're special town, you know, you're special employees because you are pulling in these all the, you know, that's why you take the open meeting law training, the ethics training, the conflict of interest trainings, all those things, because you are technically, even though your volunteers are not getting paid, um, you are your town employees, special town employees ultimately. Or city employees at this point. Um, so with that, you, and and in your role only as advisory, that's as much as you can do. I mean, I don't want to really get into you know there are friends that we like. We're not an enforcement agency, but we have a lot of friends in other areas that could do some of that. But again, advising is the role, and if it's it's really you're trying to sell it as we're trying to close this liability gap for the city. Because should someone grieve, it's going to be tough to defend. We've told you as a commission six times that this that this sidewalk on Main Street needs to be remedied. It's identified. I'm just making it up. It's identified in our self evaluation and transition plan. It's prioritized as number one in our or as a as a high priority in the transition plan, and it's now been three years and nothing's moved on it. So you know it might be that Greenfield is it's in the pipeline and it takes a year or two to get there because you know state projects for state highways take four to five years to get into a cycle and then get funded and then get done. So Greenfield might be in that same boat that, okay, I know it was prioritized and we need to do it quick, but it's still going to take us four years to get it shovel ready to do. So that's where, you know, you have the ADA coordinator with you as well. So you know, that could, that the ADA and, and, and the ADA coordinator's role is to help push and educate the departments with a little bit of authority, you know, in the best that, that you can. Um, with what what the, the new transition plan requires of, of the city or town. So, you know, let's do the low hanging fruit this year. 
let's get the, the easy stuff. And then, you know, and, but really in reality, the town, the city should have a line item really that is for ADA transition improvements every year. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Greenfield's budget is, but I've heard numbers like 1.5 to 3% of the budget should be used until all these things are corrected every year. And, you know, it's not, it's, it's a lot, especially if you have a, you know, a hundred million dollar budget. I don't know what Greenfield's budget is. I know situates around 28 or 29. Million. And I was like, wow, that's a lot. Um, 57 million. 57 million. So, you know, 570,000 will be 1%. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Quick math in my head. Uh, you know, is there an earmark? Is there a line item for that? And that's where the commission would be advising to the, you know, to the ADA coordinator, who then the ADA coordinator would take back saying that, you know, we should really make a commitment here, especially if DOJ comes knocking. And if we stall on this, we need to have a justification of why it's stalled. And that's really the, the, the strong language that the ADA coordinator should, you know, it should be relaying to the town, like, look, if we don't act on this, if we don't show our good faith effort, should DOJ show up, we're going to, you know, yes, we've done our transition plan, but we've done, you know, have, what have we done with it? What, what, what has changed because of it? Because it's not supposed to be stagnant. It's supposed to be a living document and things should be checked off every year and things should be added every year as new programs and, and buildings get constructed. So, like, for example, that bocce ball court. Mm -hmm. If that was built after the transition was done, you know, you would look at that from the trend from, you know, from the ADA perspective and do we have a route to it? Are the drinking fountains that are provided, are they accessible? Are the restrooms provided, are they accessible? And if there are deficiencies, even in new construction, that should show up on the, on the transition plan to be remedied or as items get fixed. So you built a brand new school. That means probably another school got mothballed or maybe used for a different purpose, but you can check off that, okay, the middle school, we fixed that already. So now that item is removed from it and we move on to the next item. So, you know, it's a living, breathing document. And I think that was lost originally with the original passage of the eight within the 1991 kind of thing. People did them, they did them poorly, but they did them and they had them on file, but they never touched them. That's where with the reinvigoration from 2008 with the updates to the ADA and, and the corresponding 2010 ADA design standards, uh, that and the new stuff that they cover, like outdoor, you know, outdoor rec stuff, playgrounds. Now they have some very specific coverage, uh, marine and marine and uh, fishing piers, marine facilities, um, all things that they were kind of guiding before, but now they've codified, codified into their standards. Um, those are new issues that need that, and I think your self evaluation encompasses that. Uh, so, but yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, so we did this transition plan five years ago and it identified certain things and not other things. And we've since noticed some things that like definitely were lacking, okay. but it also put these interesting numbers to certain projects. Mm -hmm. that, like it said, our library that we fortunately got a mass libraries grant and they're currently under construction with a brand new library, but it's, it said like it was $64,000 to update that whole library which was an old historic building and like there was, oh, it needed so multiple bathrooms fixed and everything. It was like, there's no way that that's $64,000, right? So I think like we are now in this place where we're trying to figure out how do we, you know, what, what do we need to do next? And some of that is we need like actual architects to come in and look at the building and figure out what the things are and how they can be fixed, I think. Um. Yes, and I'll come right back to you. Hang on one second. Um, oh, what was that? I just had a thought in mind as you were explaining that. Um, I think was that the library that we came out that I that I came out. Yes, you you Did came out with the access specialist to look at the right. library. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it was right that 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 value uh, of what they were being told even at that time, what the value of the repair was was undervalued, and and the the significance of that repair was going to be pretty big. So. Um, the ADA transition plan, it probably doesn't enca encapsulate the preferred wages, like the, uh, the, the wage, there's a certain language and I'm doing that, but there's a specific amount of monies you have to pay for the work. There's also studies that probably have to do that aren't even encapsulated into that. Yeah, to fix the toilet's great, but you need to do 10 other things just to fix the toilet. So, you know, the thousand dollars for the toilet is really 6,000 or 8,000 because we can't even get there. So, um. But yeah, those are just rough goalposts. They should be in there. And I don't know exactly who had a prevailing wage. That's what I was thinking. Prevailing wage limits. Um, 
Who was the consultant that did that? Do you remember? The Berkshire Design Group. Berkshire Design. Okay. If you, oh, it's Berkshire Regional Planning. Oh, Berkshire Regional Sorry. Planning. Okay. If you think they missed something or, or feel that they, um, or you wanted more to be encapsulated, um, you know, that may be something to update your planning grant, although I know you're trying to desperately get some project grants through our program. Uh, but if you wanted to update it at some point, that might be where you might bring in a, a secondary consultant or an additional consultant. Because you have a starting document now that's pretty, pretty, pretty recent. That they could add on the public rights away stuff if you wanted the website, you know, design stuff. You know, there are companies that can do that and consultants that can do that a more comprehensive one. Uh, yours was good. I'm not. I'm not knocking the, the one that was done. But if you feel you need a little bit more, then you you may want to see if there's funding there from uh, MOD's grant program to to build that in. But I think at this point you may want to get funding to do some of the the project stuff. Uh, get those fixed because that's going to have immediate impact mm -hmm. you know this planning just redoing this planning book that doesn't fix anything really so let's uh let, let's get some money into the dirt that's why if the town were or the city were going to donate not donate but line item money every year even five hundred thousand. i mean that's a you can do a significant amount with five hundred thousand. and maybe one year you have to do a little bit more because you might need an elevator somewhere and that's going to be a three hundred thousand. well even five hundred yeah so I'm just saying, larger projects might take years of building up that fund, but it would behoove Greenfield to have some sort of line item that is solely for ADA improvements to yeah. extend to the transition time. Yeah. Uh, and if we can fund some of that, even better. You can do more this year or or or, or more next year. Um, but that is something I think should be a strong priority for for Greenfield. And that coming from the commission to the you know to to you as the ADA coordinator, then from the ADA coordinator to your reporting departments and people, you know, you have some, I don't, again, ADA coordinator doesn't necessarily have authority, but you have, you're in a position where you have the ear of people in power uh, that should be able to implement those changes and make those decisions. And that's where hopefully as the ADA coordinator, you can do that. And if you want some backup or want us to attend a certain meeting or something with you as the ADA coordinator or the commission uh, doing it as well, I'd be more than happy to, to do some of this and help you with that. Just so they understand that, you know, the federal highway was talking about this for highway departments. When we were doing this uh, Bay State Road stuff, uh, trainings that we were doing with DOT and the Federal Highway Administration and MOD, uh, you know, federal highway was like, does your DPW budget take 2% of their budget and use it for sidewalks, curb cuts, and accessible stuff that they mm -hmm. have control over? And a lot of times, like, no, we don't even have an earmark for anything. It's just what our line item is, and we try to make it do with what we do. Uh, or we do projects that are already in the pipeline. And we're not focusing on priority. So uh, there was a lot of discussion about that. And that's really where it came back that if federal highway is doing it, I know DOJ would be looking for that potentially as well as if they come knocking uh, at your door. And Greenfield's big enough. Greenfield's a gateway community. Greenfield has a strong minority population as well. So DO, this might be a, a focus for DOJ. You know, should they, if they're looking at Massachusetts to pick a town, they may, you know, Greenfield, Worcester, you know, some of the larger cities might be on their radar. I don't know what they've been contacted about, who's contacted them. There's usually a reason they might pick a community. Um, but, you know, again, I am just saying it's it's a very, it's a liability game, really. And Greenfield, I'm not, I'm not saying it for sure, but it seems like or it sounds like they might be playing that a little bit more risky than being on the safe side. And putting that line item in is really going to put them on the safe side of things because it's showing a commitment year after year after year until it's fixed. You know, originally the ADA required everything to be fixed in three years. That's just not, it's just not doable. So as long as there's the overarching commitment that we see, and that's through a budget year after year, um, showing that commitment uh, is, is the good faith effort over the, over the course of time. Does that help a little bit or uh, hoping? Yeah, um, I have two questions, but was Virginia, did, did you? No, no, please, Lynn, go ahead. You got yours answered. Um, so um, when, when you came to look at the library, um, you brought an access specialist with you and did up a report. Yep. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is that something that we could request again with a, with a building that we had? Oh, sure. An yeah. access specialist from MOD come? 
Um, but remind me, they're not going to put any dollar value on. Yeah, on we yeah. So at MOD, we're, we'll tell you what's <laughs> we'll tell you what's not in compliance, or at least what we feel is not in compliance, and we'll give mm -hmm. you a citation with it. Uh, and which code is is trumps it, or are they equal, or is, which one's more stringent? Um, so we give you both the AB and the ADA perspective from it. But yeah, we, we aren't in a position to to roll out. It might this will be ten thousand dollars to fix, or this will be like what maybe the transition plan did. Uh, right. That is ultimately, if you're looking to getting to that point, um, you do need to hire probably outside firms. Uh, to figure out, okay, if we were going to redesign the library, you built a brand new one, so that's good. But if we we're going to redesign the one that currently exists, you need to pull in the the engineers, the the architects for the, for those types of projects. So just we're not honestly, I'm not qualified to do that type of analysis mm -hmm. for the for the dollar value. Even though I I can give you a rough estimate, like I know you know a standard elevator is about a you know close to two hundred thousand dollars a stop, or like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a stop. So if you have a three stop elevator, that's going to get you to Close to three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars to install, um, but a lift or a vertical incline, a vertical wheelchair lift might be thirty to fifty thousand. But again, I don't know that specifically, and I don't know what the prevailing wage for installing that is, and all of that stuff. That's where they can come in and probably okay. give you a better estimate. All right. Uh, so, so lots of times it it could be helpful to just have your specialist come to give us kind of a general. A general overview of what. Yes, yeah, and yeah. that can be the starting point. Mm -hmm. for where okay. you may want to reach out. You know, you're going to tell you know. So let's say I'm just going to make up a building. Let's say the uh, town hall, the city hall. Uh, you asked us to come out and do a site visit, and we found let's say three things that were maybe non that we felt were not in compliance. There, we give the report to you. You then would be sharing that with your you know, your appointing authority, with the ADA coordinator, with whoever you as a commission wanted to share it with to show those deficiencies. To, to, to highlight those deficiencies, my concern would be, does the transition plan already identify those? Um, and did the transition plan also encapsulate the state codes as well? Or did they only look at it from the, uh, from the federal perspective? So I know some, oh, I see Virginia first to maybe comment. Uh, oh, maybe. I think it did, I think they did the state. Uh, Berkshire, yeah. So they probably looked at both the state and federal, right? And then compared. Mm -hmm. So, so some of this might have already been done for you, but again, we can come out and do a site visit. We do it all the time. Uh, during COVID, we keep just the group really small. Is what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. Give it like two or three people, you know, three or four people. Um, we've done them before. Not as busy as many as we've done in the past, but if there's a building you want us to come out and look at, I'd be more than happy to do a walkthrough with you, uh, with the commission and and with the ADA coordinator, whoever would like to do it. And, and yeah, we give you the starting point. Like, look, okay. we identify these issues. They're pretty significant, you know, and we'll give you kind of in a nutshell what, what happened and what the, what the recourses might be. Um, mm -hmm. But we just can't give you the, 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 the money amount of what it would be to, to fix. Okay. So. Um, and then my second thing was um, we talked a while ago and you sent me some information about um, the MOD, MOD doing training for department heads that you have a a program that you do. Um, I think you did it for the example you gave me was the town of Canton or something like that. Yes. So in our transition plan, it was identified that um, our departments uh, were deficient, that they needed grievance procedures and training. And um, so my question is, is that something now that you do virtually or is that something that when you did it, it was a one day thing and every department head had to come. How, how did that work? So it's going to be beyond, it's going to be beyond probably what I'm going to be able to coordinate. This is going to be something probably our general counsel would get involved. I would probably get involved for the access side of things. We'd have uh, the disability rights unit involved for maybe employment related discussions. So. That is a request that I'd like you, if you were to send me that request, like, hey, we'd like to see about talking about types of trainings that MOD might be able to offer to department heads mm -hmm. uh, about the ADA or other things, then that request would probably come into our new communication and training coordinator, uh, Lilia, uh, and I, I'm forgetting her, oh, I know her last name, but I can't always pronounce it. Uh, it's Lilia M, I'm gonna go with that. Uh, Lilia M is our new training uh, in communication 
coordinator uh, for our agency. So that type of request I would take, but I would give to Lilia to coordinate with the agency because Mary, our director, probably would want to be involved. If it's if it's going to be a big commitment thing on uh, on the title two <clears throat> on title two responsibilities as it links to your ADA responsibilities. Um, that would probably be something agents that our agency would get involved. It wouldn't just be a me thing. Okay. Uh, obviously, I'm doing the CAM training, which is a good overview of the ADA, the AAV, the disability laws throughout the, the, the state uh, and, and the country, uh, as well as the built environment. Then there's from that, the advanced CAM training goes more into the built environment and gives you more case studies about uh, scoping mechanisms and what that really means under both the ADA and the AAV. Um, so, you know, there's differences like the, you know, the AAV might require more based on their scoping than what the ADA would require under their scope. So, and it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's kind of eye opening when you, when you think about it, that, you know, you're only dealing with primary function areas when you do a renovation under the ADA. So it's, it's a, it's a new concept that you don't necessarily get super exposed to during the 2 day cam trainings. The advanced cam training is a smaller group that we open up. Uh, and in fact, if you've got a bunch of members, Lynn, in Greenfield that mm -hmm. have gone to the two day community access monitoring training, and I would probably let slide the ADA coordinator. If you haven't gone to our camp training, you could come to uh, an advanced camp training. We might be able to set something up for you specifically for the town mm -hmm. specifically, um, where we could do this advanced camp training that I totally revamped. So I'm excited to present it because it's a lot of stuff. I'm just worried about the time. Like, is this going to be an 8 hour training rather than a. Four to five hour training as the advanced <laughs> camp training, but um, mm -hmm. still, still keep it one day. Um, but it is virtual at, right at this point. All of our trainings, at least for me, for my unit, is mm -hmm. doing virtual trainings. Um, other units or other like that type of training out in Greenfield, if we're trying to get all the department heads, it might be something that would come out to, uh, depending okay. on you know where we're at with COVID and all that good stuff. The numbers are starting to go back up a little bit again, um, so we're watching that. But mm -hmm. for now, we're, you know, we're in the office 2 days and we're doing work from home from, for 3 days. So that's how would you send me the name again of the, yep. the communications person for the training program yes. when you when you send the other information, that would be fine. Okay, perfect. And I will send you a link to our, uh, our training page as well. This is a way okay. to connect with her, but I'll, I'll link you to that for training requests. I'll link you to that and you can see it on our training page. So good. Yeah, I think um, I think Bob has signed up for the CAM training oh, cool. program, okay. and which one Doug is, is signed up. Is that the Newton yeah. one, or which is it? Acton. Which one of you guys, or is it June? Is it June? June? Okay, is that Newton? Newton. You. Not, I'm sorry. Is that being held virtually and hosted by the Newton Commission on Disabilities? I believe so. All you know is it's in June. <laughs> okay, it's in June, so it's gonna be that's this. Okay, and who did you register with? Was that with Ashley Santana? No, sir, I have to check my email. Uh, I think the response I got was that the slots would go to the local Newton people first, and then they would let me know if I had an actual oh. seat. It, it is going to be seats. There's, it, we have 35 seats virtually. Otherwise, it just becomes overwhelming uh, with too many people on the screen. So um, there will be a uh, it'll have 35 seats. Newton, I think, is only going to fill about like five or six or maybe 10. So we're going to have 25 available other seats. So you will be notified if you've asked to be notified about the training. We are we're getting ready to send that email, which will be sent Monday, I believe. So Thank when you. you get that email, respond back to it. Uh, follow the instructions, but. It'll be back to Ashley Santana saying, I'd like to register for it. And there's information you need to provide her. So that'll be coming out. I hope Monday from me to uh, two people. And um, uh, so that'll be coming out. So thank you. That's actually a good point. So you are interested, you'll be notified. And then we need to see if, uh, if we can fill that seat with you, but there's also 2 other trainings that we're doing as well virtually. And even though one's in Pittsfield and one's in. Acton, there we go. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's virtual, right? So you could attend those too. So if you don't get in on this one, which I'm hoping you will, uh, there's going to be other ones that we can open up to. So, and again, I'd love to offer up the advanced cam training once other members, few members get trained here. Then maybe I come back and just how many people we got on the screen here? Do do a advanced cam training for ten people, ten or twelve people. That would be great. I think uh, we'll probably all be through the initial cam training by the end of the summer. 
So, okay, yeah. And then let's look yeah. at the fall. Let's look at the fall over winter to do an advanced camp training one. Because um, <laughs> I'm trying to set, I have like four or five that are being set up now, but they're mm -hmm. so small that the host is usually taking most of the seats. So it's hard to do a general audience one. So mm -hmm. I'd like to do one specifically for you guys once we get everybody through that training, uh, through the camp training. Okay, then we'll, great. Then we'll set something up with you. All right. Um, okay. Is there okay. anyone else who has, I, I finished with my questions. Is there anyone else who? Had questions for Jeff? No? Just making a note for ACAM for or advanced camp training for Greenfield specific. Um, I, uh, I actually had one question. Oh, I have one Laura question had, that we have. Wait a minute. Oh, Laura I'm sorry. had her hand up first. Yeah, if I could just be really quick. Um, so I'm assuming that when you send us this information, I'll be able to discern um, if I have a specific question. Um, I should be able to discern uh, to whom I should direct these questions at your organization. Uh, uh, when we get the emails, et cetera. Uh, from the general public or from like a department or, or when um, somebody reaches out to the commission? Is that what you're asking or? We have, a, we have an issue at the um, housing uh, community where I am. Oh, okay. All right. And I need, I need some guidance on that. So um, I wanted to, I'm assuming that that information of who I can reach out to will be in the packets that we are going to get from you. Yes. And you would definitely want to at least start your conversation with the disability rights unit. And that's right on our brochure and on our website. You'll, uh, there's a, really the easiest way is to submit a comment, a question online through our contact us form. And that goes to the, Assistant Director for Disability Rights Unit, and she will funnel that to the right person. Okay. So, um, I will um, I will add it to this listing, but it's 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 really for you. <laughs> it's uh, it's and I wonder if there's a chat because I can just pop it in there if you want. Um, yeah, we should have a chat. So when I'm done, I will in the background while you guys are carrying on your other business. I'm going to throw the the contact us link for MOD in the chat. And that's where you should probably send your question to start. Okay. And then the right people will reach out to you to, to have further discussion should we need it. So, and, and to get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And I'll do that while I'm done and you guys are carrying on other business. So don't forget to check chat after <laughs> before you Thank you. Before you exit out. All right, cool. Um, okay. Well, first of all, I'm really happy that I came out to see you guys mm -hmm. and that we uh, were able to do this virtually. Um, this isn't meant to be a one time thing and it's not meant to be every 5 years. If you want me out sooner, by all means, uh, Lynn, just, just give me a, give me a holler, send me an email. I'm going to say that give me an email. It's the easiest way to get me. Um, and we can, we can work coming out, you know, every year or every 2 years, every 6 months, whatever you might want, uh, MOD to, to, to come out with if you want us. Um, okay. All right. Good. So I'm going to go silent. Eventually I will leave, but I'm going to get that link. <laughs> And uh, and I will send it. Was there another question, or is that a, a oh. saying goodbye? Oh, that's a wave. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, very nice to meet the new new members as well, and mm -hmm. nice to meet you as the ADA coordinator. I'm sorry, I, I just don't see your name on. Oh, uh, on the screen. I'm just I'm drawing a blank on your first name. That's what it is. It's Lindsay Rao. Oh, Thank Lindsay. You. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. All right. So perfect. Um, okay, yeah. Continue on with your business. I'll go silent. I'll throw that in chat, and then I'll say goodbye, and I'll be done. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you very you. much for. Okay. Out. Okay. Um, uh, we have a couple of things. Um, I know M is MJ still here. I I see her name there, but I don't see her. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Um, why don't we do you next, and then I'll finish up with the other things that aren't that can be kind of done pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I asked to come and visit with you folks. Um, you may be aware that uh, under the capital planning budget process, uh, my department had submitted a request for some funding to support a closer architectural study and a better cost estimate in terms of handicap accessibility improvements at City Hall. And uh, it was, um, it came out of committee, I think, Two in favor, two opposed, and one abstention. So that's on the capital uh, budget request uh, that goes to city council next week. And I just wanted to 
share with you the opportunity to be aware of that and to, uh, if you decide to weigh in on that, how you might want to um, advance that. Okay. Um, so, um, my, I guess my question about that is if you, have an architectural study, how long would it be before, um, well, let's just say this, I'm just going to make this up. I have no idea how long it takes, but let's just say the architectural study is done at the end of September and make suggestions that are going to be fairly costly. Mm -hmm. How long will it take before those projects are completed? Um, and I asked that question because I was looking at the transition plan and, you know, there's a few things to be done there that haven't gotten done. Um, I'm just going to give a quick example that, you know, there's this, this threshold to get into the clerk's office that's like this piece of granite that, that you can't get a wheelchair over. Um, I didn't think that would be such a hard thing to change is basically what I'm saying. Um, so a few of the things that were identified in the transition plan that haven't been done, I'd hate to have to wait another five years for that to happen. Mm -hmm. If it's going to, if we have to wait for the architects, um, yeah, I, I hope that that's clear. That, does that make sense? What I'm yes. saying? Yes. No, I, yeah. I, I, I hear your frustration that we, I, we did this. I can't hear you. You're. you're hmm. Barely, very, very soft. Well, I will speak loudly then. Oh. Does that work? Uh, wait a minute. What should, What are you saying, Lindsay? MJ, do you want to come into the conference room and use our technology? I don't know why my, uh, here I come. Yeah. I don't okay. know why it changed either, but it might be easier than her yelling. Yeah. <laughs> Even when she was yelling, it wasn't. Yeah, you couldn't, I couldn't really hear. So, yeah. Could you hear me at first? Well, we heard you for a minute and then you cut out and just stopped. Yourself. So, no. Ah, uh, the technology. Yeah. <laughs> and as I said, even when you were yelling, it was fairly audible. So, yeah. I don't. Well, know. and my office mates would not appreciate me speaking at that level. So, but you can hear me now, correct? No problem. Yeah. Great. So, um, then I'll start back at the beginning. So, um, this is the first year that, that, uh, my office as the office where the ADA coordinator is located, uh, advanced, took a look at submitting to the capital planning committee, a funding request to start tackling some of the more detailed things that need to be done as a result of our, uh, self-assessment and transition plan. And, you know, last summer we had a lot of conversations about handicap accessibility and proximity around City Hall, and there's been a lot of discussion about that. So we put it on, well, let me back up and say, the self-assessment and transition plan is just a very broad, very superficial examination about what needs to be addressed uh, to comply with the ADA and handicap accessibility requirements. So it, it gives you some a very low level of detail. And we knew that looking at City Hall, especially with City Hall being probably the most active older building uh, that we, we have in use for the municipality, that we wanted to start taking a closer look at the items, how to, what needed to be done and what the cost of what needed to be done at that building to make it more handicap accessible. We did this because there has been some conversation around the state about some new funding sources that would specifically target municipal and public safety buildings. And that I know is in, in the works at the state level. And that if this becomes a funding source, 
and we see that the cost of doing the architectural or the uh, accessibility improvements for the city, for the town hall are pretty steep, which they could very well be, that it might be uh, important for us to do a whole scale rethink of where and how we're providing access to municipal offices. But I think that the obligation that we have once we have the self-assessment and transition plan is to really just start to tackle that um, incrementally. And it doesn't get, you know, I, I believe the transition plan had some timeframes of suggested timeframes of when things should get done. Um, the reality is, is that we don't have any sort of coordinated plan to tackle it. This request for the capital funds to take a look at City Hall with a more trained and professional eye of a registered architect who would take a closer look at the building, see what needed to be done, get a good cost estimate, and then we would have a good handle on what we would need to do it. Or if it was really cost prohibitive, then it plays into the equation of you know, the thinking that we've been having about municipal offices generally. Uh, but we felt like we should start to tackle the listing in the ADA in the ADA transition plan. So timeline wise. Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry. We need to talk timeline. So hypothetically, right, the city council passes twenty five thousand uh, dollars next week. So then it's not available until July to even start a contract. So then it would take the an architect, I don't know how many months, but probably six months is my guess to do a study. So you're looking at December. So then we get the recommendations out and depending upon where they are in the capital plan, right? Then we can take those recommendations, submit them to city council through capital that year, which would be a whole nother year before improvements would be made. And that assumes that city council says, yes, we have the funds and we want to, we want to do that, right? So this is the, the question is always, city time funding timelines as well because the capital timeline is a very specific calendar that aligns once a year kind of as funding opportunities so you know the counselors on the call could probably speak more to that but just timeline wise it's not a fast we're going to have an answer and okay. then they're going to be fixed okay jenny so <clears throat> you're at our meeting today and I, for one, am not going to, I would not be voting to endorse this. We've been saying for years, we would like you to be, not you, it's really us. It's really us together. We've presented, Bob, Pen, Bob, Bob Williford here has put slideshows together with our sidewalks. I've had a neighbor that fell and broke teeth and her glasses and her face and other people that have been injured. Um, and this year, $64,000 was cut out of the sidewalk budget. Um, so we just listened to Jeff from the Architectural Access Board. I would like there to be $200,000 every year in our sidewalks, Sanderson Street, where we're going to put eighty thousand, perhaps eighty thousand dollars worth of renovations into that building, has public meetings held there, and is the one building that has public meetings held that's listed as inaccessible, and the fixes for that, you know, a little bit ago, and I realized that they weren't exact, but they were estimates that weren't that far away. I can't believe that we're going that we just had the skate park meeting there. Um, so my suggestion for that funding, my suggestion for the funding, if you want, if you actually wanted to know what I thought, and I everybody may think different things, I'd rather that we fixed some of the things that needed to be fixed. We've said over and over what we thought was important. I do Sanderson Street first, where we're going to be working there if you're picking on buildings the bocce courts that we're gonna put in that have an inaccessible path and every year have $200,000 in sidewalks. The bathroom in the town hall, you wanna spend $25,000 on something in the, in the town hall, if that's the mayor's first priority or somebody else's first priority, I think we've over and over again have said what our priorities were, but that's my own feeling. I'm one member of this board. 
Bob has his hand up. No, you're mute. I found something yesterday that interested me. The town does not own 20 Sanderson. Does everybody know that? The state owns 20 Sanderson. Does that complicate us fixing things? Since it's not our building, can we go to the state and say, hey, your building's broken, you need to fix it. I don't see it on the list of state properties, but the deed says, that the DCAM, whatever it is at the state level, uh, the property managers own that building. My understanding is we have a lease for it. Doesn't show up on leased properties in their list, but. I, I, I'm not sure how long we've had that building. I think since the 60s. 1965, I think is when, uh, we abandoned it to the, not to the state, but to the United States of America, which gave it to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which said, uh, okay, we're going to give this back to somebody, but it has to maintain a mental health facility or something for 20 years. So that's a long time for somebody to be paying attention to that. So now in 1985, that exemption or that restriction goes away and I don't know what happened but I have the eight page deed that where we gave it away and I don't see anything that says anybody else owns it Let's see if we're, we're paying a lease on it I don't know I believe it's a dollar a year but that is just kind of, I off the cuff and I wouldn't hold myself to that that's just a kind of historical knowledge that's somehow floating around in my brain so okay yeah. Okay. It's listed as one of our, I'm going to look into that, Bob. It's listed as one of our municipal buildings. I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. No, fine. Uh, Doug, and, and you need to unmute. Okay, I can give a, uh, shed a little bit of light on this as a, as a former union employee. Uh, we had, uh, when we had a layoff at Belstertown State School, which closed in 1992, we had employees from the Sanderson Street uh, location transfer to Belstertown State School just prior to a closing. So we're talking 1991 where, where employees from, uh, were from the Department of Mental Reservation. Um, uh, basically, uh, were allowed to transfer back to Belzatown State School, and then when Belzatown State School closed, they went out to the community, uh, in and then they changed their name to whatever it is now. But uh, that's uh, so. Back in 1992, it was still uh, under the auspices of DMR which is a state-run facility. Um, MJ, do you want to just say something? Sure. It, it, what I think I'm hearing from this group is, is that you'd like to have a more formalized role in making recommendations uh, that might, I, it, it ended up coming out of my department, the recommendation or the request of the capital campaign, uh, the capital budget committee, um, because like I said, it's one of my staff who happens to be the ADA coordinator for the city, and and we had had those conversations last summer. I think what I'm very clearly hearing is is that you'd like to have more of a, a recommending conversation with us before anything's advanced. Um, it might also be more appropriate for the request for this type of funding to come through central services, which actually manages the buildings. But we we submitted it because it, I was instructed that that. Uh, this year, <laughs> that's where it was going to come from. We were going to put that type of request forward. It was going to come from my department. So, so that's what I'm asking for is, is that, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done that have been identified by the self assessment and transition plan. I felt like this was a good process to start. Um, it might not be your top priority. I certainly hear you on the sidewalk piece. Marlo and I talk about that all the time and we do what we can with our block grant funds um, to 
be able to address a couple of years ago, we made some pretty substantial improvements in sidewalks, uh, largely because there was a clear sense that that they were really problematic, especially for some of the folks who are more uh, challenged in using them. So that's where we are, and that's what I'm, that's my request here is is that there be uh, some concurrence in terms of getting some resources to hire a professional registered architect to give us better what these are and the cost would be for the city hall building. That's it. Okay. All right. I do have a question. Doug. Uh, MJ, wasn't there already a study done at City Hall uh, a couple of years ago? My understanding is there was a, a study that was done about creating an extension or an addition. Uh, not the whole building? That's not that's not my understanding of what was done, no. I will look into that, Doug. I will get some better information on that. Yeah, My understanding is they were looking at perhaps doing an addition. Yeah, if if you could look into that one way or the other, I, I would love to have that information. Okay. So Thank just for, for background, or I don't know how much you guys understand or you know about like process, because I know we we did some other stuff. So one of the one of the one of the issues that we looked at was the four corners school that stage, right? Mm -hmm. And so while it seems like, well, you've got a stage and clearly you just need to fix it, right? We know what the problem is, but we had to bring in the architect to say, could you put a ramp there? Could you do a lift there? What are the requirements? What brings it to code? And so we brought in an architect there to give us those opinions and then to help go take us to the Massachusetts Architectural mm -hmm. Access Board to get the waiver to be able to do what we wanted to do. So it did require a professional to take a look and examine and give those recommendations. A lot of these, the hard part is like, you know, it's like, well, I know at my house that this thing needs to be fixed, but it's the question of how do we fix it that's accept, you know, that it is up to code and what are the steps to do that? And then find and the ability to say, here's how much it should cost, which this day and age, like costs are changing, I feel like weekly or monthly. Like it's just, it's so out of control at the moment. But really to give us a concrete concrete thing to be able to go to the council with because right now I don't think MJ and I could say whether it's a $25,000 fix for City Hall or a $250,000 fix or that would trigger other codes and it's a $2.6 million fix right like I think right. the problem is that right now we 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 can tell you some of the problems but we we don't have the architectural stamp to say yes these are problems and here's how to fix them and so that's kind of what that would do. And because the city hall is a voting polling place, it has a slightly higher, um, you know, use in some ways. Thank you. So I, I think when I started off about, you know, asking about timeline, I was thinking about all the things that really need to be done. I mean, if an architect comes in, I mean, there's, none of the bathrooms are accessible upstairs. I mean, the I, I was just seeing this really big ticket, realizing we'd have to do this renovation and then it would go from, you know, maybe $40,000 to, as you said, 2 million. I, anyway, so that's that's what I had in the back of my mind, just knowing, you know, using the place myself and seeing the problems um, that are there. And I, I didn't wanna see it get kicked into the, the next realm of, well, we'll remodel this and now, now you have to go full bore. So that was in the back of my mind, yeah. But also, you know, that there are a few things there and that really make it hard to, um, to use the place and it continues to, to be that way. Yeah. 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 And the budget is also an opportunity for, you know, education on this issue, you know, that as we talk about this and then we talk about the needs to improve handicap accessibility for our municipal buildings, then it's an opportunity to educate, not just the community, but also the business community about, you know, the need for this type of accessibility, you know, in our buildings and in our, in our public sectors. But okay. Oh, oh, sorry, Ginny. 
But basically, you're looking for a vote from us to sway the council. Is that correct? Because I, I just, I really would like us to be doing the things that were listed in the in the transition plan, and for us to be brought into coordination. When we put those brick sidewalks in the middle of Main Street, do you know what this board felt like? I mean, we tried to be polite about it, but um, it, 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 there isn't a coordinated. A, co a coordination between many times between what is happening, you know, what the actual plans are. And the same with, um, you know, I have concerns with, with Main Street. I have concerns that, you know, with the parallel parking and Main Street. So mm -hmm. I, um, that we're not going to be, we're not going to be really and truly looking at it, it, the ADA guidelines for the parking. And, and I would have liked to have done the buildings in order of the one that was supposed to be done within one to two years for accessibility with Sanderson Street. So I, I'm not endorsing that. Well, I just, I came here tonight, today to just share with you the information in the process. And like I said, I felt like uh, our department was asked to to make start tackling things. This is the priority that was identified um, through conversations. I, I admit that I didn't come to the CDA and ask for your input on that, um, but perhaps we can talk about trying to figure out a process for next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got a couple couple things I'll go through quickly because I know we're uh, thank you all for for staying. I just wanted to let you know that uh, the mass match assistive technology roadshow. I'm sure you all got the information. Um, yeah. It's going to be um, on May 31st instead of May 17th. Oh. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, so, um, I guess there was a hitch with the, the roadshow people, um, and that was the next available that, um, the senior center had. So, uh, I, I was a little concerned about that because it's the day after Memorial Day weekend, but, um, you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, and also, um, Bob was nice enough to, um, explore some issues with the library to do um uh um uh audiobook technology and um so we got permission from Kathy Dunn they'll set up an extra table and um um uh Pam will come and um There'll be information on uh, the the talking books and the Bard system and Perkins, and she will give demonstrate. She can demonstrate to people how to do it, and also sign up people for library cards. So there'll be a separate section for the library at the assistive technology roadshow. Um, and did you want to say anything else about that, Bob? Did um, Pam is on vacation this week. She'll be back next Monday and she was going to get in touch with you. Um, right. I did get a box of information from the Perkins library that describes what their programs are. Um, maybe we'll talk next time about uh, who approves an application to, to participate in the talking books, because I think they've widened their criteria. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be librarians would do it or doctors would do it. Um, they've added other people, social workers. Uh, so it's possible that uh, we as members of the CDA might be able to approve applications. It does include registered nurses. So we, we got those. It mm -hmm. includes librarians. I don't know whether I would qualify since I, I'm retired, but I do have a professional library degree. Uh, who can approve people for participation in the talking books program. So that they send us a lot of applications. Uh, we can tell people that the library can approve them. 
uh, and then decide whether there are other folks that might be able to approve them. If you have something that's a medical issue like dyslexia, they do need a doctor's uh, referral. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you just can't can't sit and read for a long time, or if you uh, can't hold a book, uh, then you know the normal channels can approve it. Don't need a medical guy. Okay, great. Okay, and um, just tying in with that, um, I'm just going to skip ahead of just a, a couple of things. Um, I did speak with Kathy Scott, and uh, we'll get the um, logo. I, I'm going to work with her next week. And um, Caitlin, is that Caitlin? Um, I guess they have some kind of a template that they have for the the town logo. Um, and she also mentioned to me that um, the town has used uh, the jail to have printing done. So maybe we could have the cards done through there. But she does know that I'm, I asked her that we wanted to make sure we had them for the roadshow. Um, it would be nice if we had them sooner, but I, I gave that as our goal, definitely our goal. There goes prevailing wage. What's that? There goes prevailing wage. If we just bring it to the jail, uh -huh. they, they don't pay prevailing wage. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. That's for sure. All right. <laughs> well, I, I got a quote from Staples and it was very reasonable. I mean, I'll even pay for it myself. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, just wanted to let you know where where the cards were at, Bob. I did have a question. Uh, we talked about getting the email address for the CDA, but there was not an answer to who holds the password to that. So, I'm just wondering if we know yet how that works. D does Lynn get the password uh, so she can send out an answer? I think Lindsay. Lindsay's got her hands up. <laughs> not a traditional email it's a forwarding address so it will forward to lynn and i if someone sends an email okay okay i don't know anything about a password so you'll have to tell me about it you don't need a password it'll just end up in your email it's kind of oh. like a p.o box if the p.o box automatically grabs the mail and put it back into your mailbox right i'm remembering this now you did explain it probably twice to me okay Thank you. All right. Um, good. So the the cards are in the mail almost. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, touch base with Laura about um, you had had some conversations, I think, with Aaron about the sidewalk repairs or the sidewalk program uh you're on mute thanks okay so um i i did and i thought i forwarded his um his uh response and if you like i can um read it to you i i've been so myself i've been so distracted with my house sale that I um, haven't had a chance to read. But um, Aaron sent me a draft and what he says for our text for a potential radio ad is this. Know of a faulty traffic signal, rough pavement, hazardous sidewalk, or another non-emergency infrastructure issue? The Greenfield Commission on Disability Access urges you to report it online at greenfield-ma.gov slash 311 or by calling the Department of Public Works at 772-1528. Good. Yeah. You should be an announcer. Any, yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a reader at church. There you go. <laughs> you have a great voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, what I 
what I said to Aaron was I would run it by the committee here, commission, and see if anybody wanted to add anything to that or change anything. Uh, no, I, I, it sounds good to me. Um, you, you sent that out with the I, email? I forwarded it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, maybe, maybe it got folded into all the things that he and I sent back and forth to each other. <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll be glad to forward it again. I don't know. I don't know if anyone was paying attention when I read it, but I don't believe it was much more than 20 seconds. Yeah. So no. um, we could just, we, you know, I guess the next step, if we like this as it is, would be to explore um, what it would take to do it as either an ad or a radio announcement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind sending again, I'd just like to read it. If it's all right with people, I'd like to make that decision next meeting. Um, just because we're so pressed for time, I don't want to, um, uh, you know, I just feel like I, I, myself personally, I need to just kind of read it, see it and, and um, so, uh, okay? also just another thing, Aaron said uh, that I've not met Aaron, but Aaron said that he had a very good radio announcing voice and that he would be willing to read it on the radio should there be a need. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. All right. So, if we could continue next. Um, uh, at the main session next meeting yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so we can resolve we can resolve that okay very good thank you sure um i i i'm i'm hesitant to mention elm terrace bus stop i just wanted to know if they've started any work that's all uh i have not i have not seen any activity mm -hmm. i have nothing to report okay all right and then um I had under new business the last thing um, uh, Lindsay sent us a site plan review for the Hampton Inn, and um, you mentioned that it seemed to the overarching thing seemed to be it was lacking the appropriate number of um, of uh, parking spaces for the amount of spaces that are going to be available. Did anyone take? Did, did you get a chance to look at that, Bob, to look at the plans? I did. Yeah. And uh, it's really not clear where they would go. They're, they're not indicated on the plan. They are not. So uh, there's a section to the north where the new parking lot is that has a uh, curb cut and some spaces that look like they could be handicapped slots. Uh, but they're not marked that way. And it's not clear that there's an entrance into that side of the building. So it could be that uh, they should go down with the other three that exist, which is the correct number for the number of spaces they have now. But when they add another 39 slots for their 35 rooms or whatever it is, they need to have two more. Uh, but if that's where you check in, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, if you're going to be lugging luggage into your hotel room, if there's some other entrance that's closer, they, that'd be a good place to have some some parking. But don't know. It, it's not clear what the building uh, accessibility or, uh, entrances are. Or if you just go in at the one end that exists now and walk the length of two buildings and, and up to the fourth floor. <laughs> Laura, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, Lindsay, when you when you emailed this out to us, uh, you said that you saw only two handicap spaces on the plan. Is that correct? I think there are three. I 
and go grab the plan. Um, um, it I, says I, here. I may have said two. I don't. I don't know. I think they need additional two, two additional. I don't remember. Let me pull up my email. What I, I have the email here. It says it looks like there'll be 110 parking spaces. So that requires 5 ADA of which 2 need to be van accessible. From my review, I can only see 3 ADA spaces. In the current conditions section with none appearing in the new parking area. Although there's an accessible parking space laid out layout in the details section. Okay, thank you. That, that actually answered my question. Um, so it's, I think you said they wanted us to respond by the 25th of April. Um, go ahead. You were about to say something. I didn't mean to cut you off. Lindsay. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, if, you know, in the past, we've kind of voted the thing that we've seen, and then you and I have worked together for the letter, and I think we can just copy and paste and say, you know, this is our read of it, please ensure, you know, because we're we're just suggesting things to the zoning board to say, please, please ask them to make sure that they do this. So I think we have some language from another one, but Bob. Okay, okay, Bob. I heard some somewhere in that conversation, two van spaces. I don't think that they require two van spaces unless they've got them, you know, in this new parking lot uh, separated from the other handicap parking. Because I think it's one van space every time, no matter how many handicap slots you have. And then every sixth parking spot needs to be a van after that. So if they only have five, I think they only have to have one van space. I don't know. I and and obviously they already have a van space. Right. Uh, if you look at their drawings now, so I think we just need to say that they need to add two handicap parking spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just an aside. It has nothing to do with the regulations, but. In my experience in going to hotels, the handicap spots are always taken. You know, I, I almost feel like they should, you know, it should almost be like an orthopedic doctor <laughs> where they need to have more, more spaces because, yeah. and I'm just thinking, you know, they're going to add 35 more spaces. I mean, anyway, it's just mm -hmm. an aside, but. Um, it almost seems like certain facilities should have a higher quota. That's all, but that's beside what we're talking about here. So if you'll just get uh, Ginny. I, I agree with, with Bob about the number, but that was the hardest plan in the whole world to read. <laughs> um, you, I couldn't see where they were. Um, and I, I looked at it twice. So. As, as long as we send a thing saying how many they need um, and that they should be at the closest, but you, you can work that. You, it sounds like the two of you will work that out. I'm in agreement with, with whatever you'll send out because you'll get the right number there. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to vote on something? Okay. And we're gonna, I'm sorry, help me here. I'm really tired. I'll make, want me to make a motion? <laughs> yes. You care for, okay. Um, I move that we send uh, a recommendation to the board that they have five accessible spaces, um, one of which is a van space that they will be located near the curb cuts in and um, as close to the entrance as possible. Second, Mayo. And with appropriate uh, right of way. Right? With an appropriate, with that addendum, with an appropriate right of way. Yeah. Yeah. I'll agree to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All yes. all in agreement. Yes. Yes. Passed. Okay. Thank you. I'll do I need to check in with you, Lindsay? Okay. When we're done. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to wrap this up um and adjourn in a moment. I um and um our next meeting will be May 12th. 
So uh, do I have a, a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. So Second. One, one quick thing when we're done being adjourned. Um, um, BC, before COVID, we all went to the garden cinema and uh, tried out the new lift. And it was really fun being together. So I made a, a suggestion to Bob that at some point it might be nice that we just all got together socially. We know we can't talk about certain things. Um, and Bob was nice enough to offer his really beautiful back deck, which has a ramp on it and a cover and it's it's a really nice space and i said i'd provide some food and um if people would like to get together and i know lindsay is a working woman so we would want to include her we might have to do it towards the end of the day um but just it was just a thought you know it's been a long time since we've all been together physically and i just thought it might be fun so just throwing that out to think about. Yeah. Sounds like a lovely idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what time do you get out of work? Lindsay, <laughs> I know you have to run up. You have a child to run. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. All right. We'll talk about it later. Anyway, thank you all. And thank you for hanging in there for the extra half hour. I appreciate it.